Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back once again to Samuel Adams Returns. Those anti-federalists, they did. They absolutely got it right. And this is Tom Novolis, your host. And uh, I sure am delighted that uh, you are here as we have been experiencing that. Uh, I hope, eh, well, I don't know. Maybe it's the last winter blast here at this end of February as we move into the supposed springtime uh, in northeast Ohio. We're catching that good old lake effect, so uh, it's always fun with uh, how we've had a real mild weather, you know, good mild winter, and it's been enjoyable, quite frankly. But uh, yeah, we're here. We're together with you. A great announcement that I'd like to make is that we did get picked up on uh, iHeart Radio in their blog section. So you can find Samuel Adams Returns the Anti Federalist there. If you go to the website, and for all of you who have been receiving the promos, You'll see that link to that iHeart uh, programming uh, in addition to all the great programming we do at Liberty Works Radio Network and at uh, our friends down there in uh, Soaring Eagle. Yes, Soaring Eagle Radio as well. So, oh, it does remind me, you can also uh, listen to the blog, or the not the blog, but the podcast. <laughs> Uh, at blueberry.com with Samuel Adams Returns dot net having all of those links there for you. So once again, go to Samuel Adams Returns dot net and uh, sign up for the newsletter. If you're not getting it, we don't inundate your mailbox. It's just once a week. So I'm going to start out today by saying that uh, our guest that we were going to have today had a family medical emergency and was not able to join us, uh, but he will be able to join us next week, and we will pick up the topic that Sam Adams always drove home about, local, local political issues. And we will be talking about uh, things that are happening in a, the county libraries here in Geauga County, Ohio, which touches a lot of the libraries across the country. So, yeah, I guess you can guess what that topic is going to be, but you'll have to come back next week to really get into the meat of the matter as we uh, delve into that with our guest next week. So, I, I am opening uh, today's program, and as you can imagine, I did scramble when uh, our guest let us know he would not be attending today and not being able to be available to put a program together for you. But I thought it was critical because, as always, I got tons of information. It's just taken and trying to grab it and bring it together. But I, I want to start out with something that uh, Kath shared with me. And it, it, it kind of goes like this. Uh, a mommy tried. Mommy tried. Over and over. Mommy tried. Mommy tried. Well, what do you do when a doctor puts one of your alive twins on your chest to die there? And after that first baby dies, they wrap the other baby who's been crying for an extended period of time. What was it, two hours? Two and a half hours. Wrap that baby also and put it on your chest to die on your chest. That really strikes home for me in many different ways because uh, we have twins who are now going to be 38 this year, amazingly. And I was there with Kath who had severe issues, preeclampsia during her pregnancy, and the babies had to come early. And I was in the operating room when they did a C-section and took the babies. And I even took movies of the whole process and procedure. And the um, issues that Kath had as a result of that, which we was a lot of medical stuff. So 
when I see something like this and an article like this, it hits home when the Senate this past week fails to protect life of aborted babies that are alive and opens the door for uh, that form of infanticide by a already gruesome medical procedure. So a, a survivor of an abortion is phenomenal to me in the first place, but then to go ahead and, and completely reject a living being and uh, allowing that person to die without medical treatment is uh, is not just appalling, but obviously is very unspeakable. This case that I'm talking about happened in Ohio, and because of Ohio law, these twins who were born early, they were born at 22 weeks, but because they were not born 22 weeks and five days, they were born at 22 weeks and four days, they were placed on the mother's chest to die. Now, we know medically that babies survive after 20 weeks. We know that that happens and that there are cases to do that. But this was also a <coughs> so-called Christian hospital, a Methodist hospital, that went, according to Ohio prescribed law, and gave no medical treatment, especially to the child that was alive and crying and could use assistance for two and a half hours and just ignored it and allowed it to die. Yeah. The pain. The article's there. It's there at samueladamsreturns.net. It's there in that archive. It was there in your promo for anybody that looked at the promo. So you can find that link and, and follow that up. That comes down to the whole essence of what Samuel Adams had always brought together on moral continuity. The whole idea of what is those biblical truths upon which we should govern that has moral continuity. We see the moralist of uh, the present generations and uh, the, the past as far back as the 1800s. We saw a shift in the, that moral continuity as early as 1707, as I mentioned before, when Unitarianism started taking and um, denying some of the facets of who and what God is. We see that even in the uh, pronounced predominant evangelical or maybe not evangelical as much as some of the larger dominant uh, religious organizations where yeah, the Ten Commandments are a nice thing, but yeah, they don't matter. So when we start thinking through on what I will continue to speak about this whole year on political theology, uh, that becomes a part of it. Moralism, mores, and how does that transfer into governing, into law, into that which, as we'll talk about next week, at the local levels, as much as it affects across the state level, which those babies died because of state law, and then what does that mean, as we saw with the failure to protect life uh, at a national basis with the Senate? Now, we know that the Democrats in the House would have, you know, just chucked the whole thing anyway, but, you know, not to get it past the body that is supposed to represent some sense of stability, of moral stability and such. Um, it's pretty frustrating. So with that, 
I, I took a lot of time in this first segment because I wanted to talk about this whole idea of moral continuity. What does that mean? Where does it come from? It should be established all the way back through the foundation of this nation with the majority. There were some that started going sideways, as I continuously mentioned, but the majority would look at what we are dealing with now with just a, what are you thinking? What are you doing? The, the fundamentals are that our rights come from God. And to have moral continuity means that you have to understand those basics. And the basics being, what is the Ten Commandments? And, and what does that mean, first off? To be able to grasp that, to understand basic truth in law and continuity in law, there has to be a supreme mechanism by which there is a standard for law. The Constitution is only a man-contrived mechanism to keep in check tyranny, despotism, maintain a sense of human liberty. And what we've seen, and to which I talk about, is that the anti-federalists, they, they got it right. If you don't have the morality, first off, if you don't have the churches doing their job from that prescription of God's truth, you, you don't have the continuity necessary to be able to develop law that protects liberty, that protects life, that protects property. Each and every one of those is segmented in a manner that is only accessible by the fundamentals of the Ten Commandments, let alone everything else that makes sense from an economic and societal cultural basis. It, it, it's just um, this first segment, I think I'm down to what, two minutes, Kat, is just that. Any of you that are listening out there and any new listeners is that you need to go in there, as I always say, and you need to grab your pastors and your deacons and your church leadership by the ears and really, I mean, literally grab them by the ears and shake them throw them to the ground and say that they need to fully understand the fundamentals of Reformation truth, biblical truth, and the Ten Commandments. And what that means in its societal and cultural expression, what it means to have good law, what it means to have that, what the liberals call, a decent society, a nice society. Well, I'm sorry, you can't have that under any man-contrived ideologies, man-contrived religions. And we're going to talk about that some more in the second and third segment. Um, I want to bring in uh, a article from Sam Adams in the next segment that will talk about what we're experiencing right now in these political parties, and where it was set, so that kind of gives you a little teaser here for that second segment, is that it was set in what happened after the trial of those soldiers from the what we call the Boston Massacre. What did Sam Adams have to say about that? Who was playing who? And what did it mean for our real liberties? And where did it source from? Where did those liberties source from? He writes about that. He talks about that. And then a modern pastor, philosopher, theologian, I'm going to bring in something that he has to say about socialism somewhere in the program, and uh, we'll kind of cover some of that and a few other things that uh, I want to talk to about liberty and your children's liberty and their education. And where it really comes down to is uh, that what are the rights of the parents in education? 
Sam Adams had ideas about that. The Anti-Federalists thought that although the common law said one thing, you were the purveyors of your children's liberty. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Samuel Adams Returns. Those Anti-Federalists, they did. They got it right. This is Tom Novolis, your host, and I want to thank everybody on Liberty Works Radio Network for being here and uh, all of those uh, listening to the program. Uh, very delighted that you're doing so. I would ask that if you want to see my smiling face and uh, you know catch this again, I know that uh, for sure I archive every program at samueladamsreturns.net. And what's very, very important, as I always bring to your mind for your remembrance in this segment, is uh, search out that donate button and hit that. This is a listener-funded network, and it is dependent on you to keep things going. And then check out the other programming. There's a lot of great programming out there. With all that, I want to jump back into um, what's going on today how it relates back those mirrors of history that I always like to talk about. So we heard again that there was another shooting of five people um, up there in uh, the, I guess, the Milwaukee area. Um, you know, now you have the Democrats screaming out about gun control, not even understanding, you know, trying to take away our arms, destroy our Second Amendment destroy everything that there is about this constitution and this people. And, you know, again, I always say is the anti-federalists warned that we would get to this point at some time when you had immoral, immoral, not moral people. And what I mean by that, let me define that real quick for you. That means people that do not understand the biblical, solid biblical perspective of the living God, the Trinitarian God, and all that is in the whole scripture in respect to morality. Sam Adams did. That's why Sam Adams was called the last Puritan. A letter that he wrote uh, after the shooting there uh, on the commons in Boston uh, that then took into place a trial, and he wrote in January 21st, 1771, concerning uh, that which happened and the loss of life that happened, the five lives. Isn't that this interesting? I didn't plan it this way. As I mentioned earlier, I, I put this all together real quickly this morning, so I had no time to collude with what happened and what this program is. No, this is just because I wanted to get to the whole idea of various truths. And here you go. January 21st, 1771, in reference to what happened on the 5th of March of the previous year, March 5th, 1770, when uh, five of His Majesty's subjects were unfairly lost on that evening. Then we came into the whole idea of a court case. And there were many that were unhappy. And this is where, remember, John Adams really came to the forefront on his uh, political life because Sam Adams drug him out of Braintree because he didn't want to have anything to do with politics or anything else. So John was happy to be a lawyer back down there in Braintree. But Sam got him to come up here and defend the British prisoners, the soldiers. They were put on trial and they were vindicated. They were, you know, it, it was like, oh, and everybody got all upset about that. You know, how was it? Oh, gosh. So I can't put the real analogy to it in reference to the traitor McCabe, because you got to admit that the guys there on the Boston Commons we're having ice balls, not just snowballs, but ice balls thrown at them. And somebody literally pulled the trigger uh, without thinking and four people died. Whereas what McCabe did was, yeah, he did it. He did something purposefully to uh, destroy us. Anyway, 
don't want to take that uh, too far down that path because I'll go down a rabbit hole I don't want to go down. But what I was intent on talking to you about was some of the other parallelisms that are going on. And when we look at the McCabe's, the, all of the others that are what we call now a deep state, it, it comes to this as Sam Adams was concluding this article that he wrote in reference to that event. He goes this way, I shall conclude what I have to say upon this interesting subject in my next, and that being in another letter. In the meantime, let me assure Philanthrop that I am fully of his mind uh, that a true patriot, quote, and he's quoting Philanthrop, will not from private views or by any ways or means foment and cherish groundless fears and jealousies, end of quote. But perhaps we, not, uh, we may not be so well agreed in our determination when the fears and jealousies of our fellow citizens are groundless. It is, I believe, the general opinion of judicious men that at present there are good grounds to apprehend a settled design to enslave and ruin the colonies. You see, there's a subtle plan to enslave and ruin the United States of America. Okay, there's the beginning of that parallelism. And that some men of figure and station in America have adopted the plan and would gladly lull the people to sleep, the easier to put it in execution. But I believe philanthropa would uh, be far from acknowledging that he is of that opinion. The fears and jealousies of the people are not always groundless, and when they become general, it is not to be presumed that they are, for the people in general seldom complain without some good reason. The inhabitants of this continent are not to be duped, quote, by an artful use of the words liberty and slavery in an application to their passions, end quote, as philanthrop would have us think they are, like the miserable Italians who are cheated with the names, quote, excommunication, bulls, crusades, etc., they can distinguish between, quote, realities and sounds, and by a proper use, quote, of the reason which heaven has given them, end quote. They can judge as well as their betters when there is a danger of slavery. They have a high regard for George III, as others have, and yet can suppose it possible that they may be made slaves without enslaving themselves by their own folly and madness. They can believe that men who are born of our bone and flesh of our flesh, born and bred among us, may, like Achan, for a wedge of gold, detach themselves from the common interest and embark in another bottom in hopes that they, with their wives and children, let's see, what's that? What, 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 what's the guy's name that's running? No, he was a vice president. With their wives and children. Oh, that's Bernie Sanders with his wife and Biden with his wives and children will one day stand and see and enjoy and triumph in the ruins of their country. Parallelisms, parallelisms, okay? Such instances there have been frequently in times past, and I dare not say we have not at present reason enough for exclaiming with the Roman patriot, O tempora, O mores. The true patriot, therefore, will inquire into the causes of the fears and jealousies of his countrymen, Donald Trump, and if he finds they are not groundless, he will be far from endeavoring to ally or stifle them. On the contrary, 
Donald Trump will, constrained by the Amor Patriot, the, the love of a father, the love of a patriot, and from public views, he will by all proper means in his power forment and cherish them. He will, as far as he is able, keep the attention of his fellow citizens awake to their grievances. Trump rallies and not suffer them to be at rest till the causes of their just complaints are removed. Drain that swamp. At such a time, philanthropes, patriot, may be, quote, very cautious of charging the want of ability or integrity to those whom any of the powers of government are entrusted, end quote. But the true patriot will constantly be jealous of those very men, knowing that power, especially in times of corruption, Biden and crew, makes men wanton, that it intoxicates the mind, and unless those with whom it is entrusted are carefully watched, such as the weakness or the perseverance of human nature, the perverseness, excuse me, the perverseness of human nature. They will be apt to domineer over the people instead of governing them according to the known laws of the state to which alone they have submitted. If he finds, that being the patriot, upon the best inquirer, the want of ability and integrity that is in ignorance of or a disposition to part from the Constitution, which is the measure and rule of government and submission, he will point them out and loudly, Twitter, loudly rallies, he will loudly proclaim them. He will stir up the people incessantly to complain of such men till they are either reformed or removed from that sacred trust which it is dangerous for them any longer to hold. Okay, I'm going to stop right there for a minute. But I got a minute and a half. I got two and a half minutes. So you see that, that parallel in history, I keep telling you, is that Donald Trump doesn't even know what he's doing. He knows what he's doing in knowing what he's doing because the guy's brilliant in that, but he doesn't know that he's walking in the parallels of history from an article that Sam Adams wrote in 1771 and, and that a true patriot will be able to see and identify these things. And he's not going to stay quiet about them. He's going to be out there and he's going to be loud. He's going to be boisterous. He's going to call them for what they are. He's going to drain the swamp. And not only that, when he finds out all the anti-Trumpers in the administration within that government agency and entity, he's going to go, you're fired. Get out. <laughs> We think that there's stuff that's new. You know, it's a, it's like I always say out of Ecclesiastes 1.9, there's nothing new under the sun. You know, God understands that. He, he takes and he brings it to the forefront of the minds of people that are willing to be molded. Keep praying. Keep praying for Donald Trump to drain the swamp. Keep praying that others around you will become aware and enlightened. Keep praying for these apostate churches, because they are. Keep praying for those that are leaders out there in the Reformed movement who are willing and have been for years to stand up. Keep praying for those that are, are in other classical uh, religions that are coming to the truth, as that Catholic bishop did this past week, and standing up and saying that the Senate is allowing infanticide. They opened the door wide. You have a Roman Catholic bishop that is taking a strong position 
in favor with what is true, what is constitutionally correct, what is morally correct, what is that continuum of morality. And as Sam Adams put it, will be loud, will be bold, will understand because he and those anti-federalists, they did. They absolutely got it right. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to this third segment of Samuel Adams Returns, those anti-federalists. They did. They absolutely got it right. This is Tom Navolis, your host, and uh, wow, we're having some fun. That was pretty interesting in the last segment, and I want to welcome everybody from Soaring Eagle uh, back. You really need to go to that uh, second segment. I encourage you to either uh, download the podcast, and once again, I want to remind everyone that uh, not only are all the archives at samueladamsreturns.net, but the podcast gets put up on Blueberry. It gets put up at uh, Apple, whatever. I can't even remember what their music stuff is. Uh, it's even, and now we're at iHeart. And uh, again, all that, those links are in the uh, newsletter as well as at samueladamsreturns.net. So uh, right at the top, on uh, the program archive is the podcast. You can download it and listen to it whenever you want, but you can also go to YouTube and see my smiling face and uh, enjoy the expressions that go along with uh, what I have to say. But uh, with that, uh, we had some very interesting perspective on the parallelisms of uh, 1771 after uh, the, the letter, or I should say the article that Sam Adams wrote in relationship to uh, the murder of the five people, uh, not in Wisconsin, which sadly happened, but on the green in Boston, which we now call the Boston Massacre. Now, I got some interesting news. I'm sure many of you have seen, and this goes into the next pieces to which I want to talk about and bring in some philosophical minds and uh, stuff you've already know and heard, especially those that listen to this program regularly. But it's a good refresher, but another perspective. And to note that, you know, I, I've talked to you about, and I've given you the resources and the reference about who the Democrats are. I think I broke it back in 2010 I wrote an article and all of that that uh, they it, it came out of the Communist Party USA that they've taken over the Democrat Party. The Democrats were losing it for many many years, and as you remember, within the twenty the the twenty one objectives of the Communists for America that's read into the congressional record. One of those was to take over one or both of the political parties. And in 2010, the Communist Party USA declared that they own, they have taken over the Democrat Party. And the documentation, I still have it. It's back in the archives someplace. Uh, and to prove that, I've continuously talked to you about the uh, Progressive Caucus, the Congressional Progressive Caucus. And one of the founding members is Bernie Sanders. And I also mentioned to you that Nancy Pelosi was a member of that, but she stepped out of the membership of that caucus when she wanted to become Speaker of the House. So now we have, just as of Thursday, that the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, says that if Bernie Sanders, socialist, actually a Marxist, if he becomes the nominee, she will support him. Duh! You think? Come on. Nothing new. We knew that. 
anyway, I just thought that that would be a little bit fun as we then kind of scroll over and rotate over, if you will, to um, what I want to share with you is, uh, boy, two things. One, I got to speak about this before I get on to the rest of Bernie Sanders socialism and all sorts of stuff. So there's a lawsuit, and this goes and ties into education, which I don't think I'm going to have time to, so I'm going to ha have to look at all of that. But anyway, there's a lawsuit where uh, parents are suing Google for secretly monitoring millions of kids. And quite frankly, this is both Google and Microsoft in all of their insanity on keeping records on your kids. Anybody that's child who has a Chromebook, um, your kid is becoming part of the, the global mechanism of uh, the matrix. They are just becoming a number in the matrix. And uh, yes, that is correct. They are plugged in. So as they become teenagers and then they go on to be corrupted within college, will they take the blue pill or the red pill? Can they become un? plugged. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that is up to you to stop that initially, which brings us to, and the article is there for you to go ahead and read, you know, because then Google makes its claim, oh no, we're not doing all it is, blah, 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 blah. We're only, you know, they've got their excuses, so you can go read that. I'm not going to spend my time uh, chewing uh, down through uh, that fat, if you will. I'd rather spend my time uh, talking a little bit more about um, this whole idea of the, uh, I don't know, the, 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 the theological perspective on uh, the uh, socialism. Uh, let's see, three reasons why socialism should not be considered as a butterfly's boot by Pastor Doug Wilson. I like this guy. I mean, not just for the fact that I ha knew him when I was in the Navy, but for the fact that uh, he is a thinker. He understands very deeply Reformation theology. He understands the application of biblical truth, which many evangelicals uh, either do incorrectly or will not even go near, like I know several of the large churches, <clears throat> that won't go near what it means to apply Scripture, but um, I guess because they don't want to take a theological position. That's why, in my opinion. And you know, I have no opinions whatsoever. I mean, I'm just one of those guys that, oh, Kathy's looking at me and laughing. Yeah, no opinion. Right. Anyway, uh, you know, if you take and you go uh, to the archives, SamuelAdamsReturns.net, and you look at that link for this article on three reasons why socialism should not be considered as the butterfly's boot, you'll get to understand what the butterfly's boot is. But I just want to take you through some of the uh, basic concepts. Let's see. Uh, Doug goes through this idea of what the uh, when the seventh commandment prohibits adultery. What is the presupposition in the restriction? Oh my! Here comes a first cultural perspective, and that being that the supposition is that there it's about another man's wife or a, another woman's husband. Interesting. So adultery uh, wouldn't be possible. Wouldn't have any hook to it. Any meaning about it unless there was something already predefined and supposed. Uh, then it goes on to the same thing about, he talks about on uh, theft. And what does it mean not to steal? Um, that comes under the presupposition that there is a such thing as private property. You can't steal something that you don't have. 
And uh, then there's questions here about taxation, and there's questions here about what's the legitimacy. What is the question when a government, what does that mean when government steals based on legitimate taxation in Romans 13, 6 and 7? Wow. Uh, there, there's key points in there. Uh, then it comes into this whole idea of socialism. Well, we've talked about socialism from a, a lot of different ways. But here's one thing that I thought was a real good story that uh, I am going to quote, that Doug quotes, is a story about uh, Leonid Brezhnev, who in the warning days, and I'm quoting from Doug's writing, in the waning days of the Soviet Union, bought himself a fabulous DACA. Quite proud of his acquisition, he was showing his mother around the grounds, the manicured lawns, the placid ponds, the outbuildings, the stables, the palatial house, and so on. And as they were completing the tour, his mother was inexplicably sober and quiet. He, Brezhnev, puzzled by this, asked her what was wrong. She looked at him and said, But Leonid, what if the communists come back? Ooh, interesting. So there, there's a lot more here in this article that takes us through uh, some really key points in the nutshell of it all. It comes down to the fundamentals of where I opened the program with. Is there a God in heaven that has determined who we are, what we are, and how we can fulfill our being? ultimately for his glory. He knows the answer to that. We can too if we submit to him. And that comes then under the guise of the political theology and what religion is predominant within the political system. So we know within the context of socialism, it is the disruption and the intent to destroy anything that looks to the God of heaven, looks to a sovereign of the universe. And under postmodernism, which we talked about in several other programs and will continue to develop, is that you're your own God. You can make it up as you go which really fits the socialist Marxist communist perspective because, you know, Marx, he, uh, he, he hated that whole idea that there is a God, that there has to be a sovereign, that there has to be someone that holds all things together and gives good order to all that there is. So, you know what, if there's no God, then, you know what, he could be married and have some kids that die in poverty and as well, he could say that there's no God and nobody should have to worry about all of this stuff and that, you know what, if you take a living being and put it on its mother's chest, it's okay to watch it die. You can take and have infanticide. You can take and uh, steal from all and give to none. I mean, oh, excuse me, you, you, you can steal from all and give to all. Or you can take and control everything. Or you can do everything that has been going on in America under the guise of, oh, it's constitutional. Think about it. Well, you do. You think about it on this program. That's why you're on this network and why you listen to the podcast and why you go to the YouTube to see my smiling face. But... Uh, Anyway, the, the, the point of the whole matter is that it does matter. And, and there is no continuity in life whatsoever unless you have a God perspective, unless you understand that there is moral determinants, unless you understand that the only way that the Constitution of the United States of America can work is by which John Adams. James Madison and others said that we need to have a moral and virtuous people. Otherwise, 
constitutionalism doesn't work. It can be manipulated as we saw, and we see with the Democrats in the House of Representatives and those in the Senate as well, and that which is the deep state. But remember what we did in the second segment and go to that reference that's there about Samuel Adams and what he wrote uh, in 1771 that says, if you're a true patriot, you're going to be out there yelling, screaming, and riling everybody up because you know what? Sam Adams did that in such a way that the anti-federalists, and he got it right. And come on back next week when we have our guests to talk about the local issues.